So uh, thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate your time. Um, it's uh, exciting to have all you guys you know, present with us today, even though that presence is virtual and all you, you guys have uh, certainly precious time. So thanks again from all of us at Paragon for joining us. My name is Ty Smith and i um, joined today with Chris Harrington. He's our general manager for INC at our New York facility. And we're going to walk you through, uh, you know, some of the things about our INC repair program we think are important for you. So let me just go over a, a few uh, housekeeping notes. So we're going to keep everybody on mute for the duration of the webinar. Uh, that's just to kind of help with some distractions. You know, maybe you've got kids at home like I do or, you know, dogs barking in the background. So we'll just leave everybody on mute for a little while. Uh, if you have a question, please use the Q&A button. You should see that at the bottom of your screen there, um, the bottom of your Zoom screen. We verified that it's working. I've got a question from, from Jim and everything, so we're, we're in good shape. Um, I'd also like to point out that this webinar is being recorded, and we're going to upload it to our Paragon YouTube channel and send that link out to everybody that's registered for the webinar. It'll also be available you know, through our website and then through our um, LinkedIn account. And feel free to send that to your colleagues uh, who maybe couldn't join us today or that you think uh, could be you know, impacted by this content or enjoy this content. So just a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. I'm going to talk just uh, briefly about who Paragon is. Then we're going to talk about you know, why INC repair should be your first option when talking about your INC assets. Uh, Chris Harrington is going to talk uh, through our uh, you know, technical capabilities, uh, give some really good examples of things that we've repaired in the, pre in the past. And then I'm going to go back into some, um, you know, best in class examples about developing a repair program and some of the attributes we think are important uh, for a well implemented repair program. Then after that, we're going to uh, have a wrap up with some questions, some Q and A. So don't hesitate. Uh, if you have some questions along the way, you can go ahead and, and ask them and then we'll, we'll store them and answer them at the end. All right, next slide, Matt. So, you know, who is Paragon? So just real briefly, you know, most of you are probably familiar with us through uh, some program or another that, that we have, but we're the largest uh, non-OEM nuclear focused business in the United States. We're proud to have 185 dedicated employees that are working every day in our business, you know, helping uh, nuclear plants, DOE facilities and DOD facilities, you know, meet their commitments. Uh, we were created from ATC Nuclear back in 2017 you know, became Paragon as a part of that transition. We then acquired uh, nuclear logistics in February of 2020. Uh, so they've been added to our team just recently. We're really excited to have all their capabilities, you know, on our team now. I point out that our QA program has been audited by, you know, all the, all the big uh, um, industry groups, including NUPIC, NIAC. We've been audited by the Department of Energy and Department of Defense. So all that's being said to make you feel confident in the, the type of work that we do at Paragon. We've got ASME stamps at our Texas facility, including an end stamp. And you can see on this slide that uh, we're, we're just covering one of the many solutions that we have at Paragon, INC repair in particular, but we, are, we have a full uh, complement of, of ways that we can help uh, nuclear power plants and other facilities, whether that's from you know, through alternate sourcing where you're getting a part from you know, another nuclear utility or out of a warehouse, you know, through to commercial grade dedication, reverse engineering, equipment qualification, which is a, a great asset that we added with our purchase of NLI, all the way through to, you know, complicated custom design of things like, um, you know, INC equipment or custom design MCC cubicles and custom switch gear. So one of the things we want to make sure that, that you know about is that we try to make it as easy as possible to find your solutions uh, with Paragon. You can do that via our website uh, and our Peaks catalog. So that's at paragones.com. And you know, you may ask yourself, well, what is Peaks? Well, Peaks is a combination of a lot of things. It's, uh, it's data that's loaded into a catalog. Uh, it's matched uh, with our intellectual property so that you can see all of our solutions in one place. And then there are the people that are there to help you um, get those solutions to your, to your plant, whether that's our NIMS associates working with 
rapid response or our inside and outside salespeople helping you with uh, you know, dedication or reverse engineering. And we've got 9 million parts loaded into that catalog today. And there's a myriad of solutions available to you uh, through Peak. So I'd encourage all of you guys to go to Paragon, uh, our Paragon website, you know, use the search feature, explore it. It's very easy and intuitive to use and a good way to find your solutions. So with that being said, we covered who Paragon is. Let's talk about, you know, why repair should be on your, your top of your list of ways, you know, to help your plant uh, find solutions. So I'll start first with just noting that as part of the delivering the nuclear promise initiatives that were started by NEI, um, you know, repair was specifically called out in the efficiency bulletin 1630, you know, as a way to help uh, with material cost reduction. And it's, uh, it's complemented by things like commercial rate dedication and reverse engineering as uh, ways that your uh, power plants can help uh, reduce the cost of operations. So, you know, I, I, you know, one of the statistics that we're really proud of is that we offer about 60% cost savings with repair while, you know, providing such high quality that our returns are less than about 1%. So last year we shipped out 400 cards and components that we'd repaired. Only about four of those failed to meet uh, plan expectations upon uh, receipt. So a really good uh, program and, and really high quality. So let's talk about, you know, some of the benefits of INC repair. And I'm going to talk through them uh, briefly here, and then we'll go into more detail. So first, uh, it's oftentimes more cost effective than, than purchasing new uh, from the OEM. And I'll give some examples of that. I think it's, you know, really INC repair is an excellent way to help extend the life of obsolete assets that are at um, power plants. So it gives you more flexibility in that response. We'll cover that in some detail. Um, INC repair equipment helps improve equipment reliability. We have a really good example of that that we're gonna talk through and, and how that uh, decreases plant downtime. And then the last bullet and last thing I'll cover is how INC repair gives you some flexibility to respond to plant uh, emergent needs. So uh, what about repair versus buying new? So what we've seen uh, in our time with Paragon is that we average cost savings of about 60% versus the purchase of new safety related cards from an OEM. And that's real cost savings that, that, that's providing real money back to, to our customers. So as, a, as an example, we have a, a utility that we've partnered with for uh, a number of years that has a really well implemented uh, repair program that we're gonna talk a little bit about further in the presentation. And they've been averaging three to $4 million a year of cost savings through card repair since 2014. So that's over $20 million of aggregate cost savings versus the purchase of new cards. And using peaks and using the data that we have, they were able to go in and flag 13,000 CAD IDs as repairable in their catalog. We'll talk a little more about how they did that and how Paragon supported it. And then on a micro level, I just want to point out an example that just happened about uh, three weeks ago. We had a card that uh, you know, a plant called us, the, the OEM had told them that it was non-repairable and that it was gonna require replacement. And so um, the, the, um, the utility sent the card to us, they had us take a look at it. We, did, we deemed uh, through Chris's team that it was repairable, in fact, we were able to repair the card and that, got, that saved the side about $25,000 uh, versus purchasing new. So you've gotta, you know, always take the, the initiative to send a card to Paragon, even if the OEM has, has told you that it's non-repairable. So let's talk a little bit about something I'm really passionate about, and that's about you know, extending the life of you new know, plant assets and really helping nuclear power plants survive in the, in the, the modern uh, electrical pricing market. So repair gives you some flexibility to support particularly obsolete cards that you, you don't have through other programs. You can take a, a card out of an obsolete INC system. You can repair that card you know, four or five times before it needs to be replaced. And so it really gives you flexibility to keep bridging the, uh, the longevity of that system until you're able to either get a replacement um, system installed or until you know, end of life for the plant, uh, depending on, on how you're able to, to get capital for replacement. Um, additionally, repairing uh, components is a great way 
for our team to build up the intellectual property needed for reverse engineering. So we get to understand cards a lot better when we're repairing them. We understand how they function. We develop test plans. All those things roll into you know, the intellectual property for reverse engineering. And uh, it, it's really a shortcut for Chris and his team you know, after we've repaired a card. So a, a really good example of this that, that has real meaningful impact to the industry is the Woodward Governor Control System for um, Terry turbines. And they're installed at most of the facilities in the United States. We began repairing those um, components many years ago. And through that time, developed the ability to reverse engineer it. Uh, we've reverse engineered that system and have documented uh, cost savings about $5 million per site that has uh, utilized that as a, either a bridging solution or just you know, deferring um, you know, system replacement forever. Um, and it's, a, um, I think, a really unique example of the, the kind of cost savings that we offer. Uh, that system has been approved by the BWR owners group as a direct replacement for the OEM system, been rigorously tested, and uh, just you know, kind of validated our approach to reverse engineering. So uh, another point we want to touch on, on the, one of the benefits of INC repair is that it improves equipment reliability. Now, some of you may think that's a little counterintuitive. So how does repairing something improve uh, equipment reliability? Well, when you look at the info research on uh, parts that cause AP 913 related events, you know, circuit cards and circuit boards are the number one reason for uh, you know, plant related events at, you know, for maintenance. And uh, a part of that is that when you're pulling you know, parts out of your warehouse, they may not have been functionally tested for a very long time. And so as, as an example, there was a, you know, a recent utility had an AFI on parts quality, particularly related to a couple of events that were caused by circuit cards and other INC components coming out of inventory from their warehouse. Um, so as a part of that, they sent 200 uh, cards up to Paragon you know, for testing and repair. And upon you know, our as found testing of those cards, about 30% of those cards were found to either be you know, not working at all upon uh, applying power to them, or they failed to really meet the functional test requirements uh, and perform as expected. And so you know, we, were, we tested and repaired all of those cards uh, up to the EPRI Gold standard. We turned that around in four months and we continued to work with that utility you know, testing new cards as they either get them from commercial suppliers or testing cards out of their inventory going forward. So let me talk briefly about our emergent support. And the first thing I'd point out is that, you know, we are a nuclear focused business. Um, we understand what it means to have 24 seven, you know, coverage of, of um, customer service. And, you know, Chris and his team in New York, myself, you know, Doug, our president and CEO, all the way down to everybody in the organization are really committed to providing that, that level of support to all of our customers. And so what you'll find uh, through INC Repair specifically is that you can send us a card for repair and we can turn that around faster than the OEM can even manufacture a new component for you. And Chris is going to talk through several different examples later on about our, our abilities to, uh, to provide emergent support. But just one that I picked out uh, for today is a, a card that we received. We repaired, tested, and returned that to the customer within 72 hours. And I think that's a, that really validates you know, our commitment to, to the industry, number one, to provide that support, but also that you know, a lot of times it is faster to repair those cards, get them installed back into the plant. You know that they're working, that they've been functionally tested you know, through our, uh, our handling of them in New York. And, and because of that, you just take the card right off the truck, install it in the plant, and you're ready to go. So with, with that, I'm gonna turn things over to, to Chris Harrington for a little while. He's gonna talk in much more detail than I'm capable of about some of our uh, capabilities, uh, processes, and other things, uh, some examples in, in New York. And uh, so Chris, take it away, man. All right, thanks, Ty. Hello, hello, everybody. My name is Chris Harrington. I'm the general manager for the INC facility up here in Schenectady, New York. Um, as Ty had mentioned, we are new pick audited and operate a 10 CFR 50 Appendix B program for reverse engineering, repair, and dedication. Um, today, we're going to talk mainly about the, or all about the repair capabilities of our facility. Uh, we support about 60 repairs a month and have the third largest 
repair program supporting the nuclear industry. Uh, our repairs cover an array of INC components from simple circuit boards with a handful of components to complete drawer assemblies and even some complex digital items. The object of a repair is to return that INC component to its original specification. This can range from typical refurbishments where we extend the service life of, through replacement of age sensitive components such as aluminum electrolytic and wet tantalum capacitors. We also evaluate all discrete semiconductor and passive components through ex extensive functional testing. During the course of the repair, we'll evaluate and correct items for uh, cases of like overheating or any previous deficient workmanship. And we often find uh, barrier strips like the picture in the middle there where they're typically cracked or the flanges are broken and they're chipped and hardware is often worn or even missing. Um, so we correct those, all those issues as well. Often the large rack mount power supplies that we repair have metal chassis that may become bent or twisted, and so we'll straighten those out and replace them as needed. Also, we'll repair and replate any worn or damaged uh, gold card edge fingers uh, to ensure that they're a good corrosion-free contact can be made. Uh, we perform all this on safety as well as non-safety related cards, including performing the repairs to uh, EPRI gold standards when, when requested. We're often supplied with items that are deemed unrepairable, either by maintenance department or other vendors, even by the OEM, as Ty had mentioned. You know, don't throw those items away. Uh, due to obsolete nature of these items, it may be quite costly to perform system replacement or upgrades. Instead, send them to us and we'll evaluate if we can perform an actual reliable repair on those items. Uh, the example on the top left shows a pre-amplifier that was deemed unrepairable by the OEM and we're able to diagnose and correct a failing op amp issue using like a free spray technique. Um, the picture in the top right shows damage from a overheated component. Since the carbon char that was left on the board was found to be conductive, the area of the board was actually cut out and the board substrate was replaced and the uh, traces next to it were also repaired. Um, example on the bottom, the power supply was an example where a carbon comp resistor degraded over time to the point where it overheated and disintegrated and we weren't even able to identify it any longer. Um, without any OEM documentation, we were able to tell, uh, to tell us the value of that component. You know, there's just bits and pieces left over. Um, our team was able to analyze the circuit and determine what the function of it was and, and replace it and return the component to its original uh, function. What separates Paragon from other repair facilities is you know, a variety of things. First, as, as Ty had mentioned, we're able to support emergent solutions um, or situations uh, with 24-7 support, and I'll highlight a few examples later on. Uh, second is that we fully test all of the inputs and outputs based of, uh, of the item based on its design of the component. In a lot of cases, there's little to no OEM documentation, so we have to develop a schematic of the unit and then perform analysis of the circuit through manual calculation as well as simulation to really understand what the unit is supposed to do. Um, but the crux of our success really relies on the thorough functional test procedures that we develop. And all those procedures have lengthy justifications that provide the foundation for the basis of that acceptance criteria. Since Paragon has a variety of knowledge in our other programs that Ty had mentioned, you know, such as reverse engineering, we'll able to use some of those tools and experiences to assist with developing test fixtures for highly complex or high volume items where some temporary test fixtures or clip leads just won't work. The picture on the top left is a universal test fixture that we developed for a system of several large logic cards that contained up to about 150 discrete IOs. Uh, this fixture contained four Arduino modules and a display. Um, by using off-the-shelf components like that, we were able to quickly develop a, a pretty complex test fixture with minimal cost um, and, and, a, and, a, and a quick turnaround as well. The picture on the top right shows an example of our schematic capture, our PCB layout, and our 3D modeling tools that we routinely use. Um, the picture on the bottom left is a test fixture we recently developed and are currently using actually this week uh, for repairing an EHC servo valve amplifier. Uh, this is a simple test fixture that just provides connections for external power, 
um, a couple calibration potentiometers, LEDs to indicate IO status, and a couple switches to toggle some plant level um, interfaces. Using this text fixture, we're actually able to uh, run through a, a, a procedure that the plant provided us. So it's, it's a direct replacement or direct application specific uh, functional test. So a lot of our repairs start with the site sending the item in with a $0 PO. Um, sometimes we'll have a buyer reach out to us and say, hey, is this something you guys can repair? And we'll say, hey, send us a picture and we'll give you the thumbs up, thumbs down before you even send it in if it's something we can repair. Um, so the item will be received and a, a quick visual inspection will be performed. Our team searches our database to see if it's something that we've done before or have any technical info on hand. If not, we'll then reach out to the site and see what information is available, such as schematics, manuals, or uh, other bench test procedures. Our engineering team then compiles all this technical information, fills in any gaps, then develops our functional test procedure. The item is tested as found to understand the current state, and then troubleshooting and repairs are made to return the item to its fully functional state while replacing any of the age sensitive or um, failing components. The item is then burned in or operated for an extended period of time to stimulate uh, system conditions to mitigate any infant mortality. The item is then fully tested after the burn in and an equivalency or evaluation report is documented to tell the story of what happened and you know, what our as found condition was, the repairs that were made and any form fit and function equivalency of the components that were installed. We understand that due to the age of the equipment or the proprietary and confidential nature of the uh, information is not always feasible to be provided. Um, therefore, we've built our repair program around not having any information and just a piece of equipment being supplied to be repaired. Um, in a case where there is no documentation, we almost always have to trace out the entire board uh, component by component to develop a schematic, which is used both to help troubleshooting and developing the test procedure. The schematic is then analyzed and the unit function and acceptance criteria are developed. As you can imagine, this is, you know, with some complex items, this can be a very time consuming and labor intense process. Um, in the case that some minimal documentation is available, it could be such as like a schematic or a tech manual. In a lot of those cases, we get like a some system level documentation, like for a battery charger, we might get some very thorough information on what the, the input and outputs of the whole battery charger system are, but when we only get one circuit card out of that system to repair, a lot of that, those technical manuals don't go down to the level of that one component. So it still requires a lot of effort on our part to, to be able to create those procedures. In a situation where we have some really good documentation, there might be like a, a schematic, a theory of operation, some tolerances of the inputs and outputs, and maybe even a troubleshooting and calibration guide. Um, but overall, we're able to efficiently process all levels of available information. But of course, the more info we have, the less time it takes for us, and therefore the lower cost to the site. Sometimes when we're trying to repair some of these uh, old equipment, right, there's a lot of obsolescence that comes up. And sometimes we have to come up with some unique uh, solutions to overcome some of those. In this case, this is a switching power supply that had this unique four-legged capacitor where the uh, you know, two legs are the capacitor and the other two legs were to provide mechanical support. But an equivalent capacitor could not be sourced that would physically interface with the board as well as provide the right capacitance and voltage. So the team here developed a, a small interface circuit board that allowed us to mount four readily available capacitors that altogether met the capacitance and voltage rating needs and interface to the host assembly. In this case, the, the fit and function was equivalent, the direct, but the direct form was not equivalent. So the capacitor package was seismically tested to ensure that the uh, solution met the qualification requirements. This is an example of uh, uh, some EHC cards that we had repaired. Um, that was preventing a site from starting, restarting after an outage. The site sent us 50 or so cards out of the system and out of their inventory. Uh, the problem with this card in particular was the obsolete DC to DC converter circled in red there. Uh, we could not locate any original converters or find a direct replacement. So what we did is we, we sorted through all the cards that the plant had uh, supplied us and we were able to find ones that did 
meet the requirements of the output of the voltage regulators. And we were able to refurbish uh, those units as well as several other to get them out of, out of their, uh, uh, to get them restarted in about three or four days with our around the clock support. Um, so we reduced their, you know, their downtime to a minimum there. And then we were able to get their, the other cards up and running by reverse engineering that little module on the top right there as a drop in replacement so they could get all their, their spare cards uh, fully functional as backup. Now, I believe they actually even rotated out some of the cards that, they, that we originally supplied them and replaced all the old DC to DC converters with, with the new solution there. Paragon has frequently requested to provide you know, on the clock, around the clock support. In this case, the, the station was in a 72 hour LCO due to a, a failure of 120 hertz or 120 volt 60 hertz inverter. The inverter was couriered to Paragon where we performed a failure analysis and determined that a custom transformer and inductor circled in the middle there had overheated and actually burned up to the point of causing a short within the system. You know, because of Paragon's unique capabilities and expertise. We were able to rewind both the transformer and inductor in a short order, along with repairing and refurbishing the rest of the assembly within 72 hours, preventing the unplanned shutdown. Another recent case here is, and that's a picture of the system, um, where Paragon was requested to provide around the clock support. This is a, a couple pictures of a plant computer there was no information available for the system. So Paragon was faced with the challenge of, you know, tracing out all these wires and connections to create a schematic, develop a test procedure, perform failure analysis and re repair and return the item to the station. It turned out that there were several of these wire wrap uh, joints that had become loose, causing some intermittent connections. So we we're able to fix that along with replacement of any, any uh, age sensitive capacitors. And we replaced a couple worn out high resistance push button switches and returned the item to the site within five days turnaround. As I mentioned before, our repairs vary from simple INC components to more complex. Um, in this example, it's a whole IRM system drawer. Um, the re this repair effort consisted of 10 individual modules, which you can't see from the picture, they're on the other side there, as well as refurbishing the whole uh, system chassis. The customer wanted us to replace greater than 80% of the parts for a full overhaul to extend its useful life, which meant replacing well over 600 parts, along with replacing all the interface connectors between the drawer and the individual modules, as well as completely rewiring the drawer. Uh, other items of note, and circled in red there, is, the, is a multi-deck selector switch. That was a custom component that would have taken you know, several weeks to get a replacement. In this case, we were able to fully disassemble it, uh, clean it, and re-gold re plate all the contacts um, without having to re re, uh, replace it or wait for the replacement item to be available. Um, so this kind of highlights Paragon's unique ability to rejuvenate and revitalize some, some custom components without having to replace them. And Paragon was able to complete this full scope of work in about three weeks to meet the station scheduled work. Last example here is a uh, repair that Paragon was able to do for a thyristor monitor card. In this case, the, the OEM would no longer support this system. And so the site was really kind of stuck with this, this system. Um, this is a well, complex digital item with multiple, multi, multiple microprocessors <laughs> for programmable chips and a proprietary communication bus. So there, this, is, this is the case where there was a, some great system level documentation, but no specific information for this particular car. So Paragon was able to design and build and program the custom test fixture that evaluated the performance of all the, the card IO as well as overall functions. So with this, this fixture and this, this test procedure that we developed, we were able to troubleshoot and diagnose the issues and found uh, a failed RAM chip, uh, logic, uh, chip as well as a microcontroller that was failed um, and once we replaced those components the card was returned to a fully functional state. In this case you know due to the the complex nature and the urgent need uh, Paragon worked closely with the station to come up with a solution that met their their needs. So that 
kind of wraps up the, the technical demonstration of Paragon's unique capabilities for INC repair. And turn it back over to Ty so we can cover how to develop your own site specific repair program with Paragon. And thanks, Chris. That was a, an excellent uh, technical presentation. I get excited every time I, I see all those different uh, solutions. I would say only in the nuclear industry would you see a, you know, still see a microcomputer with uh, wire wrapped, you know, um, pins <laughs> on it. So that's, that's really interesting. We just, we get to see a lot of cool stuff here at Paragon. It's yeah, exciting. Yep. Yeah. So let, let me talk a little bit about the elements of an effective repair program. And uh, we think that, you know, managing the implementation process well uh, of a repair program is really important. And we try to walk through three different elements of that, you know, to, to really make it uh, as effective as possible and to save plants as much money and, and produce as much cost savings as possible. The number one way that we help you with that is through uh, use of data. And I'll highlight that in more detail. Uh, we help you with, you know, being effective in your change management process. We have some ownership of that process along with, uh, with the sites. And then uh, efficient contracts for repair that really reduce the, uh, you know, kind of reduce some of the uncertainty around repair pricing and things like that. So let me talk a little bit about using data to identify repairable cards. And I spoke earlier about a utility that was saving you three to $4 million a year. Uh, through their repair program. And we, they did that uh, with a partnership with Paragon. We went into their catalog system. Uh, we downloaded all their inventory. We used our, you know, our Peaks uh, platform to do some detailed searching on keywords like power supply, circuit card, uh, you know, INC component. And all in all, our team in New York reviewed about 16,000 CAT IDs and their detailed descriptions and came up with about 13,000 parts that, were, that, that would be repairable by Paragon. So that utility took the extra step of going into Passport, you know, marking all of those uh, parts as repairable in the inventory system, and then they added a sticky note uh, into each one of those CAT IDs, you know, noting that it's a repairable item and, and further noting the blanket purchase order that, that they could use as a buyer to, uh, to send those cards back to Paragon. You know, through the implementation of that, that utility saw about a 400% increase in the usage of the repair contracts, which again would quadruple the, the cost savings uh, for their, um, their INC repair program. So another really uh, interesting example is one that was put together by our colleague, Dave Mueller, who spent a long time with Exelon in supply chain. And uh, he, along with the site, developed an on-demand repair program. So, you know, with, with Paragon, we get this inventory data from a number of our utility partners every week. And so we, that includes things like demand signals. So when, the, when, they, uh, when a part has demand against a material work order. So the site sent about 200 items that uh, INC components and, and INC circuit cards, they were on repair hold in their inventory. Uh, we stored those at Paragon's warehouse uh, after we went through and made sure that we could repair all the ones they had sent. And we repair those cards based on a demand signal in peaks. So when there is a demand from the station, we go and take that card out of inventory. Chris's team and our team in New York go through, repair that card. We, you know, we burn it in, we test it, and we ship it to the plant you know, just in time for the scheduled work. And I think one of the important features to that is that there's no, you know, there's no cost outlay to repair that prior to there being any demand for the part. And it just helps keep your, your inventory values at a minimum as you repair just in time for demand. Another important element to implementing a, a great repair program is change management. And we've experienced this with uh, a number of our utilities and, and they have helped us and we have helped them you know, change, through the change management process. So Paragon will come in, we'll host a training at each site or we'll host a you know, virtual training like we're doing today to ensure that all of the personnel understand you know, Paragon's capabilities. So that extends through the supply chain organization into system engineering, uh, into design engineering, and then into INC maintenance. So we'll educate them on our capabilities. We'll also help identify the process for uh, you know, seeing which cards are repairable and then making sure that those cards make it to Paragon for repair. So I've got an example of a sticker that we put on the you know, static resistant um, packaging 
that you know go it, it already has our address on it makes it very easy for the shipping receiving folks to get those cards out to Paragon. Another point for change management is that it, it's really important to have a you know a corporate sponsor either at the site or at the you know at the utility level that's setting expectations for the program's implementation and, and setting up some cost savings targets. And as at Paragon, we'll report information back to those uh, stakeholders. We'll tell them how many cards we're repairing. We'll look at the, you know, is the slope increasing or is it decreasing? And, and so that that, that that sponsor and then the other um, stakeholders at the station can figure out, okay, are we doing enough uh, for repair or do we you need to you know, make some further modifications of our process to make sure we're getting all of our benefit out of a you know, repair process. And the final thing I want to touch on is the use of blanket contracts. Uh, one thing that's, that's you know, fairly unique to Paragon is that there's no cost to evaluate a card for repair. So you can send your cards to us. It's a low risk uh, event. You know, you're, you're going to know the cost to repair it before you, we ever start working on it. So, you know, if you say, you know, it's too expensive, we'll send it back to you. Um, we have blanket contracts with several major utilities. That helps us give predictable pricing uh, to the utilities that's based on the repair complexity and the available documentation. And what we found over the years is that when you have a, you know, a blanket purchase order set up, if you're able to do so in your, uh, in your systems, it makes it very convenient for buyers to issue cards out for repair it, it helps, uh, you know, it kind of lubricates the process, makes it much easier to, uh, to send cards out. And that just, that, that, in, that ease and convenience just encourages that behavior, um, you know, through the use of BPOs. So with that, I just want to cover a few uh, key takeaways. There we go. And so um, what I want you to remember after today is, uh, you know, INC repair is really a, an excellent way to re, you know, help plants reduce costs. And um, we really believe in, in delivering the nuclear promise. We believe in this industry and we wanna help make it as cost effective as possible. And so INC repair is, is really a, a important component to that. Uh, we've noted that you know, our cards are all, and components are all tested uh, prior to being shipped back to you so that when you receive them, you're ensured that they work and then it in, improves equipment reliability at the plants. Um, you're gonna take them off the shelf, install them. And if they've been through our repair process, they're gonna work uh, as intended when you receive them. We make it easy to identify cards that can be repaired you know, through our PEAKS program, whether that's you doing that yourself uh, through our website and using PEAKS online to do that, or we can come in, we'll take your inventory data specifically and look through all of those parts, make sure that we have flagged all those as repairable, and then report back to you all the CAD IDs that we've identified that are repairable in your system. And the fourth and uh, you know, final note that I wanna make is, you know, we're, we do this day in and day out. So as, as Chris noted, we've got 60 cards a month that we're repairing through Paragon. That's the largest non-OEM repair program in the industry. We've seen a lot as our examples uh, you know, highlight. And we're learning new stuff every day. So don't ever think that you've got something that's either too complex or too broken uh, to send to us for evaluation. We've uh, done things, I think, that surprise all of us uh, that, as being able to repair. So just encourage you to, uh, to reach out to us. Uh, we've got our contact information listed on the next slide so that you understand how, um, how we can help you. And we'd be happy to, uh, to come to, to your facilities when we're able to. But in the meantime, if you have a, a group of people at your nuclear station or at your DOE or DOD facility, you'll know, please reach out to us and we're happy to provide this same type of training and, and introduction to them just like we're doing right now today. So with that, I'm gonna open it up to uh, any questions that anybody has. I uh, see we've got a couple right now and then I got uh, one over email. So if you wanna send us one over email that I'm happy to take them that way as well. Um, so the first uh, question we've got is, you know, what's the easiest way to get in contact with Paragon re regarding a request for repair? Well, um, there's a few different ways you can do that. Obviously, uh, my email address is here on this slide. So is Chris Harrington's, along with our phone numbers. You're welcome to call either one of us uh, to get that help. But you can also uh, use our website and go and request a quote. 
All those emails go to a variety of people in, um, in Paragon. We'll get back to you and make sure that you know how to, uh, how to get in touch with us. And if you have an open, um, if you've got orders with Paragon or you can issue purchase orders to Paragon, you're able to send a, you know, a $0 purchase order uh, into Paragon and we'll evaluate those cards. You can, you can send us pictures uh, prior to ever sending a card out so that uh, you're assured that we're able to repair something prior to us receiving it. Uh, the next question uh, that, that I've got here, I'm gonna just make sure I know how to do that, dismiss these that I've answered. So how does uh, Paragon know demand? Is it from work orders, purchase requests, material requests, et cetera? So that's a really good question. I appreciate that. Um, so we, we get demand uh, through our industry partners. Uh, that's typically all the you know, US domestic utilities, some international utilities. They send us that data as part of our uh, PEACH program. And so they tell us when there's something on demand, uh, usage, um, all those things uh, are part of our of the data that we receive, and we make use of that uh, that data, you know, in a variety of different ways. But one of them is to to signal that you know for that particular site where we have all those cards, you know, hey, this is it's time to repair this card. They've got demand for it, so they're going to pull one in, out of stock. Let's replace it with a repaired card. All right, great question. Thanks for that. Uh, another question that we've gotten so. It's a two-part question. So have we already worked with Ontario Power Generation in Ontario, Canada, and do we have a repair uh, facility uh, within Canada? So a great question. So the answer to that question is yes, we've done uh, a number of repairs for OPG uh, in, in, within our nuclear, both safety-related and non-safety-related repairs for um, OPG. And Chris, do you want to highlight just a couple of those uh, for, for the folks? Uh, yeah, so we actually currently have uh, one of the uh, uh, EHC systems. We've done yep. a couple parts for them. Um, we have a couple. We, I think we have one in house right now that we just. Yep. So yeah, we, we yeah, we've done. Uh, we did a really complex reverse engineering uh, system for OPG as well. In the yeah, past. for the the Parsons EHC system. Yes. Yeah, and just to complete that answer, so do we have any uh, facilities in Canada? We do not have a facility in Canada today. Our facilities are located in the state of New York, the state of Texas, and the state of Tennessee, all within the United States. And I will add that the, uh, our Appendix B program um, meets the requirements of the Z299, so we're listed right. as, as that's acceptable for use. All right. I've got another question here. I think uh, it might be uh, where I misspoke and someone caught me. So uh, <laughs> it says, is Paragon the third largest or the largest third-party repair facility in the industry? So. Uh, by all measures, we're the, the largest uh, third-party repair facility in the, United, in the United States, at least as best uh, as we can tell, uh, that serves the nuclear industry. Um, so here's a, here's a question. So um, my utility has a very strong internal refurbishment team. How and where in the process can Paragon support a facility with refurb teams in place? Well, I think that's a, that's a really good question, and thanks for asking it. The, um, I think in, in the past where we've come in, in particular on some of the more complex items where it's not practical for an internal refurbishment team to do those types of repairs. We also come in oftentimes when there's a backlog of repair and somebody needs to work that backlog down. Uh, so I think there is an opportunity for us to help you uh, when you have a strong internal refurbishment team and you can always call us with questions or maybe you can send us, um, if you have a particularly difficult problem, you know, Chris uh, and you know, Chris Harrington, John Sester, some of our other repair engineers are, are available to chat about that. Um, you know, no purchase required. You know, we're here to, to help you guys out. Yeah, we'll have, uh, I add to that, Ty, is I've, I've seen uh, plants that have their own refurb team. They're, they're, they're busy you know, addressing the problems of the day and they can't get to that backlog. And a lot of times they, in their maintenance department will have a stockpile of cards that they just haven't gotten to, or they just don't have demand for today. You know, so that's where we can work on, you know, getting those to us and repairing them, you know, in, the, in parallel with what you guys are doing. Right, right. So uh, I got a question over email um, and I don't have a great answer for it. So I'm gonna have to ask it to Chris Harrington. Oh. It's specific about 
um, using foreign manufactured items in repair and how do we screen those items? So Chris, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I, you know, most semiconductor components are made outside the United States. That's not a, no, no secret there. Um, and even some surplus components are only available in some overseas locations. So that's where we have a, a thorough receipt inspection process as well as a component vetting process to make sure it, it meets certain criteria before it even gets installed. So not only screening for um, um, counterfeit and fraudulent, but also making sure the part meets all its criteria or design criteria. You know, the component's going to function as what it's do what it's supposed to do. And then when it does get installed in the item, you know, it goes through a rigorous testing out, you know, program as well as burn in and, and, and functional testing at the end. Yeah, great. So it gets tested in several, several, several modes throughout the repair process. Um, one question we have is what is Paragon's reliability rate on the repairs made on equipment? I think we touched on that a little bit, but Chris, you want to go into a little more detail there? Yeah, I guess as, as Ty had mentioned, you know, we did about 419 or so repairs last year. And I think three or four of those we had, you know, we got returns last year. Um, so the reliability is really high, you know, especially considering that we're sometimes we're, we're, digging out parts of a circuit board to replace it because it's burned up or it's it's 20 or 30 years old you know we won't we certainly won't make compromises when it comes to reliability and we won't repair something that we don't think we can we can provide a re re reliable repair for yeah oh, good um so an, another good question for you chris how often are we seeing failures during our burn-in process uh, for uh, repair yeah it happens it's it's not very frequent um, and I would say it's, it's typically not the parts that we're putting in. It's usually through the burn-in process. Some of these cards have been sitting on the shelf for 20, 30, 40 years mm -hmm. without being powered up. So, you know, our burn-in process, you know, it really stresses those components that may have tested marginally when we first received the card, but through that burn-in and, you know, constant power and loading, they, it flushes itself out. And that's usually what we wind up with failures, but not, not the new parts so much. Yep. Good. So here, here's another question for us. Uh, are your clients U.S. based only or do we work with uh, nuclear power plants around the world? So I can answer that question. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we have uh, we've done some work in Canada, but we've really worked with nuclear power plants across the globe um, for, for INC components, even for repair. Um, we have an employee that works in Canada uh, for us. You know, Mo Mohammed is our, our representative there. And then across the world, we have other folks that, that help us in, in Europe, in Spain, uh, particularly in Taiwan, uh, in Korea, um, in Mexico, and in South America. So we've seen the need for repair across the globe. We've partnered with a number of people in Northern Europe, both in Sweden and Finland. So we definitely have the experience of working with international um, nuclear power plants. And, you know, it, it's, uh, it's got its own kind of unique uh, challenges there, particularly, you know, communicating across time zones and in different languages, but we understand how to address those and we can certainly help you uh, no matter where your nuclear power plant is based. As long as we can do business with you, um, we're able to, uh, to support your repair needs. So here's a, a follow-up question um, based on our answer about OPG. So when you repair a, a PC board, so a printed circuit board, have you essentially taken over the OEM and their liability? Do you have the OEM's consent? So, um, Chris, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, I mean, you know, part of it is we take over the Part 21 responsibility. And when we do the repair, we don't necessarily take over the OEM liability from that standpoint, but we, we adopt the uh, design control aspect of it as part of our repair. Right. And that's how we assure that it that it's going to meet the form, fit, and function equivalent. Um, and then follow on. I think maybe maybe it's worth a, a follow up with with Nadu. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think you know, um, Matthew, if you want to get with us after this uh, webinar, send us an email, or or we'll get back in touch with you. Uh, we can address some of those questions. So that, that, it's a really good question. I think it's um, really detailed and nuanced in its response. Absolutely. So the next question we got is, is there a hybrid repair, which means that, you know, it, a part of it needs to be reverse engineered and then a part of it is, is uh, you know, repaired. So Chris, we've got a couple yeah. of examples of that, don't we? 
Yeah, um, so we've, we've run across that on several instances and there was like a couple in here that were um, uh, examples of that. But yeah, you know, we're talking about items that were designed, you know, like I said, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, perhaps 50 years, maybe even. Um, so we do run into parts that we just cannot find those replacement components. In that case, you know, sometimes it's, we can find an equivalent part that'll bolt right into the, where the original was. And, and sometimes like that capacitor example, we just can't, we can't find something that, that'll meet the overall unit form, fit and function. So we'll reverse engineer it, whether it's we make like a little circuit board to interface with some other components, or in the case of, you know, the industry is, uh, the electronics industry in general is pushing towards surface mount parts, you mm -hmm. know, through hole components are more and more difficult to come, come by. So sometimes the, the replacement parts are a surface mount port part where we develop an interface, you know, circuit board or something to be able to install it in the original location. You know, it, you know, there is a, a limit to how far you want to repair and reverse, you know, repair, repair and refurbish a card. You know, as I mentioned maybe four or five times and then, you know, the, the plated through holes come out and the uh, traces start lifting. So there, you know, like I said, there is, there are some limits to that and we certainly don't, don't perform anything that we wouldn't consider as being a reliable solution. But there, there are right. tools for us to, to do like a hybrid type repair. Yeah. Right. Yep. Good. Uh, so let's see another um, question. I think more for you, Chris is, you know, how does Paragon perform full functional checks on modules that doesn't call the gold standard, particularly buffer amplifiers that contain operational amplifiers. Does that make sense to you? Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, like I said, our, our, our functional test procedures validate the cards, all the inputs and outputs, right? So, and even in the absence of, with or without some OEM documentation to tell us what it's supposed to do, we'll sit down and we'll create the schematic and we'll develop a test procedure that then loads or the outputs or supplies the inputs to the maximum range of what that, that card is designed to do. So it, it's, it really comes down to being able to understand what it's, what the schematic is. And then mm -hmm. I, I could say, hey, you know, well, based on this resistor and, and this feedback loop and this type of op amp or buffer, you know, whether it's logic or, 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 or uh, analog, and load that circuit to what that component is rated to do. So that way we ensure that, you know, it, likely when it goes install and to be installed in the host assembly, it's not going to be loaded to that level, but we've vetted that the component meets, you know, that particular component meets its, its requirement. Yeah, good. So Matthias, if that's not, uh, if you have any further follow-up questions, just let us know. We'll, we can explore that in more detail with you. Yeah, we can certainly provide some examples of some procedures that we've developed that, yep. Yep. That, through that process. So here's a, here's a good question. Uh, when it comes to getting schematics or other OEM information, the proprietary nature of some of these can't be provided without OEM consent. Does Paragon have any agreements with OEMs to use their information? And the short answer is yes, we have a, a number of agreements uh, with different OEMs uh, to get access to their information. Uh, we um, were able to do that um, with, you know, probably 30 uh, different alliance partners. Not all of those are with uh, INC Repair, but we've done that on a, on a recurring basis, including some, you know, very large OEM providers of equipment. So the short answer is yes, it's limited, um, but we, we understand what, you know, we have to address some of those things without OEM consent. And we'll help you ask the OEM for consent particularly if they have told you that it's obsolete or non-repairable. Oftentimes you guys are able to get the, the, uh, the rights to, to um, you know, support your equipment when you need to. So uh, what types of qualification tests do your repairs undergo before they're installed back in the field? So uh, Chris, you can answer that. Yeah, so, so most of the repair refurbishment activities, we do uh, a technical evaluation for the equivalency in regards to mm -hmm. fit function as well as qualification. Sometimes when we're replacing some items that might be of particular uh, sensitivity for qualification, like um, relays for perhaps or switches or you know some kind of electromechanical component, in that case we'll we'll have the subcomponent uh, go through a, a seismic test or you know whatever radiation testing or evaluation, um, and, and we'll do that prior to installing it in, in the host assembly. And you address some of that in the equivalency evaluations as well, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so typically in our equivalency evaluations, we, like I said, we cover 
you know, what, what the original component was, what the new one is, mm -hmm. um, how the parameters line up, and if there are any, any um, differences in form fit function or, um, you know, temperature ratings or any of the, the common uh, parameters. So um, another question I think is a good one for you, Chris, because I don't know the answer to it. Uh, are you repairing a, any multi-layer um, printed circuit boards? If so, how do you figure out what the internal uh, layers connection is? Yeah, that's that's a tough one, right? So that's some of the more more of the challenges with some more modern electronics um, that have both through hole components as well as multi-layer circuit boards, and you know that's where. It, it, you have to rely on having a schematic uh, or, you know, being able to understand what that component connects to. And then you can do like a, an ohm out test and, and buzz it out and make sure it has some connections. But yeah, on a multi-layer board, if we have no information and you really, and it's sometimes the, the two internal planes on like a four layer board are just like a ground plane and a power plane. So mm -hmm. if you could tell that there's no trace that you can't see on top or bottom of the board goes anywhere, um, then it should have been connected to one of those planes. So maybe there's some simple checks like that, but yeah, it does pose a challenge. Sure. And, you know, our, our full functional test evaluates the card at the input and output interface. So, you know, uh, we think that most of those, if not all of those should be covered through the functional testing. Makes sense. So do we have any experience at, at, at Paragon doing software repairs or are we only doing uh, hardware repairs? So, so we've done a little bit of both um, with software repairs. Um, when we consider a software repair, we would consider like, um, we've seen instances where maybe like an EEPROM chip, mm -hmm. um, they have like one gold standard one that keeps getting moved from board to board to board and they have, they want another board that has that EEPROM chip. So if we can get a, get a handle of that, that one EEPROM chip, we'll be able to, you know, if it's if it's not locked, we'll be able to re record all the information on that chip and then be able to replicate it on subsequent EEPROMs. Um, outside of that, if it's some kind of embedded firmware, that's where it really becomes challenging. It's not something that we've had to, to do at this point, but we've done a lot of EEPROM replacements. That's good. As well as, sorry, um, uh, FPGA or not FPGA, but uh, CPLD type chips where it's... Right. Uh, um, so here's a follow-up question. So um, uh, do we have any, uh, are we already approved by OPG? And I, I think the short answer to that question is yes, we are on a uh, approved suppliers list for OPG and for, uh, for Bruce Power in, in Canada. Um, and that's, that's true across all of our facilities, whether you're in Texas, Tennessee, or New York. And they specifically uh, approved our repair and reverse engineering programs. Um, so yeah, we we're fully uh, approved for uh, delivery of, um, of equipment to OPG. Um, here's a question about burn-in. So when we're doing a burn-in, do we provide um, inputs and outputs to functionally operate the board or is it uh, power only, or is it some mix thereof, Chris? Uh, so it's a mix thereof, right? So uh, typically we try to set the card up, or if it's, if it's, a, if it's a card, um, that's like some kind of logic or analog processing card. We'll try to set it up in a, in a manner that mimics uh, uh, plant loading if we know the system. If not, we'll, we'll load it to the, to the limits or just below of the components that are installed on the board. Um, sometimes it's, it's a dynamic test, right? So there might be like a function generator that sweeps through a, you know, a range of frequencies or voltage amplitudes over time, or it might be a dynamic test that cycles on and off relays or indicator lights to make sure that mm -hmm. they burn out prematurely. Um, in the case of power supplies, we've had customers uh, say, hey, we want it, we want it loaded at 25% increments up to 100% over the 100 hour burn in period. So we oh, okay. set up burn ins that step it in 20 and those kinds of increments over the, the course of the burn in. Wow. But we try not to do just a power on but a, a full you know, simulation of what it would see in its, its normal everyday life once installed. So um, a, good, a good question here about uh, repairing both digital and analog printed circuit boards. So we touched a little bit on that, but I guess the short answer is that we, we have repaired both, you know, digital and analog printed circuit boards. Um, it's really a question of, you know, how much information we can get. Is the, you know, software locked versus unlocked? Are we able to you know, create a, you know, a testing, um, a test rig for that. 
it's difficult, really difficult to go in blind and not have any information about a digital component and yeah. begin to troubleshoot anything to get started because you just, you have a really hard time functionally testing any of the components. So uh, we'll take a look at things. Uh, it's easy for you to, you know, if you can send us just a little information about you know, the application of a digital um, system, we can typically tell you pretty quickly whether or not we're able to repair that or not. Um, I can't think of any analog circuit cards that we haven't been able to repair um, because of complexity. We were able to address all those. Yeah, think, no, we've, yeah, no, we've repaired, you know, from like pico ammeters, mm -hmm. logarithmic type uh, pieces of equipment, all the way up to, you know, um, high power battery chargers, you know. Yeah, right, you know, high, high voltage power supplies yep. for, you know, radiation monitoring, you know, there's 4,000 volts, you know, DC, yep. things like that, right? Yep. Um, so here's a good question. So what is our experience um, with utilities using our repair reports as configuration control or documentation within their SAT work management and document control system? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Chris, do you have a, yeah, I guess, so I guess uh, it's not from that standpoint, but I can tell you that um, so all the documentation that we we develop, we provide to the customer. So, you know, we spend all this time to develop a test procedure. We give you a copy of it as part of our deliverables, along with our equivalency evaluation. Yeah, I'm just not 100 percent certain how that makes its way into into the, the, the customer's repository of information. Right. But we we all that becomes the uh, customer's property with repair. So, you know, just receive a card, but you receive the schematics that we developed, the test procedures, all those things that, that help add to the intellectual property of the, uh, of the site. And, and we don't restrict use on that either. So you can, it's, it's really is the utilities property. That's how we look at it. Um, so we're going to go back to, uh, you know, um, again, uh, real quickly. So his internet went out while we were answering his question, Chris, but we, we always aim to please. So um, how do you perform a failure analysis on cards containing operational amplifiers and passive components that do not uh, call out the EPRI gold standard? Can we touch on that again, Chris? Um, yeah, so I'm not, you know, the gold standard doesn't necessarily um, give you a lot of tools to do the failure analysis so much. So, you know, typically if we're doing a failure analysis it's because the purchase order we received and the customer is looking for a failure analysis saying, hey, mm -hmm. I need to know why. I need to get a root cause. So when we get in those situations, we have um, you know just the experience of testing these things, and you know, we've been doing it for quite quite some time. We have some really smart people doing it, but you know we have things like we've sent chips out to get um, completely delaminated or boards delaminated to run through layers of boards. We've had chips um, where they they like ground down the top and they use some acid right. to expose. The, um, the the die in the middle, and they can do an, an analysis of the uh, the bond wires and the, the silicon. Um, so we've used a lot of tools like that in the past to do some of those um, failure analysis. You know, other than you know hooking a scope up to it, hooking uh, multimeters up to it, and probing several points, not only at the card edge or the, the, the interface of the item to the host system, but also inside the circuit to mm -hmm. be test particular points of interest that uh, and be able to diagnose what has either failed or is slightly out of tolerance. We've seen a lot of um, carbon comp resistors. They just, they, are, they, they absorb moisture, they drift over time. So we do some insert system checks, same way with transistors and zener diodes. You know, those are the kinds of things that we, we our technicians are well-trained and well-versed in, in checking for on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh, great. So it looks like we're up to our, our final question, and, and I really appreciate all the all the great uh, questions that everybody's given us. If you have any others, uh, please go ahead and ask them now. Um, but our, our final question here: Have you considered expanding our business to develop our own, uh, you know, hardware, software, INC solutions on top of repairing? So that's a really good question. Um, the answer is yes. We we have already expanded into those um, in, into that. We've designed. You know, both hardware and software for a number of customers. Uh, in particular, I'd highlight um, we did a project with a utility where we designed, you know, both a you know a software interface to a Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cellular connection on top of designing an, an analog isolation system for that same component that you know made sure that uh, if there was a cyber intrusion, that the safety function of that device 
couldn't be impeded from working because of that in intrusion. Uh, we also designed a uh, custom design just last year, a uh, interface to a plant computer uh, that, that had safety signals that were coming into the plant computer bus. They needed a safety related isolation system you know, for that. Uh, there was no uh, off the shelf component available. So our team went in, we, we uh, custom designed that. And in fact, uh, you couldn't find anything off the shelf that could fit the form factor, whether that was safety related or non-safety. So we were able to compress the form factor of the uh, device so that it you know, fit into the original uh, field installation uh, and, and custom the design the connector edges so that you could take the field wiring and plug it directly in. So yeah, we've, we've uh, certainly delved into those uh, hardware and software design. Um, and we'd, we'd love to do more of it you know, as, uh, as those um, opportunities uh, come about. So it looks like with that, Chris, um, we've answered everybody's questions. Uh, we've, we've educated you guys on the benefits of INC repair, and uh, we truly appreciate your time. It means more to us than, than you can know. Uh, we'll make this, uh, this webinar available to you guys, um, and um, we'll go and, and, and load it onto YouTube. We'll send that link out to everybody. And uh, once that's available, you guys can send it around to, to everybody that you know that might be interested in this topic and they can, um, they can view that there. If you have any follow-up questions or you wanna understand uh, uh, something in more detail or you'd like us to you know, develop a site-specific uh, you know, presentation for you, uh, just you know, send any of us an email here. Chris and I are, are both available. Uh, if you have a, a salesman whose contact you know, uh, please uh, get back to us and then we'll follow up all of these uh, with emails to you guys so you know how to, to get back in contact with us at Paragon. So with that, I'll say goodbye to everybody. We appreciate it and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on another uh, Paragon webinar very soon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.